Unpacking Mormonism and Other Religious Trauma is meant for educational purposes only. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Unpacking Mormonism and Other Religious Trauma. I'm your host, Sarah Westbrook, and I'm here by myself today. Um, We got an email recently from a listener, and I wanted to share what they said with you because as we are getting ready to enter the holiday season, there is so much anxiety about being with family or having to communicate with people or being with people you don't really like being with and putting on a happy face because it's supposed to be a happy time. And I think that this email um, and and my response to it is really um, beneficial, especially as our holiday reminder that you're allowed to be human. So our reader says, um, Dear Sarah and Mason, I recently had a heated exchange with a colleague I work with. They had some valid, I'm sorry, they had some valid issues, entirely fair, but the tone and volume were hostile and mocking at times and with no space to allow me to respond. When prompted to respond, I would be interrupted and mocked or told I was wrong. When I would ask how I deserved to be spoken to in this style, they said to me that my behavior had brought this on me, and they replied more than once that I deserved it. I want to kind of remind our listeners, don't worry, this is not the end of the email, there's more, Um, but I wanted to respond to this first paragraph. I want to remind the listeners that recognizing the set and setting when you're going to have a conversation with somebody is incredibly important because when you know you're talking to somebody who is not in the brain space of listening to you or trying to understand what you are saying or being willing and open to constructive criticism, or if you are not in the brain space to hear what they are saying or being open to constructive criticism, usually it's best to say, hey, Now is not the time for us to talk about this and exit. It is incredibly difficult to do. Um, Taking that 20-minute break to calm or soothe your physiology so that your frontal cortex is back online and you're back in a logical, rational, creative problem-solving brain space is difficult. It takes a lot of practice. I remember in the beginning when I started to recognize, hey, they're not in the space to be listening to me and this conversation isn't going to be fruitful, that I would just listen and say, "Mm -hmm, mm-hmm, 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 I need to think about that. Thank you. Mm Mm-hmm. I need to think about that too. Thank you. I need to think about that too. Thank you. I need to think about that too. Until I was out. Um, that's an okay way to do it. Or it's also okay to turn around or just say, until we can talk about this, utilizing more respectful tones, I'm not talking. And to leave. That is okay. It will feel terrifying. It will feel uncomfortable. It's not supposed to be comfortable because your brain is saying, fight back or flee or freeze or I'm going to start people pleasing. I'm going to start telling you what you want to hear just so you'll shut the fuck up. We do that. That that is what our brain does. And so it takes practice to learn how to engage or disengage when the environment, when the set and setting are not fruitful for productive, meaningful, connective communication. Um, this email goes on to say at the end of the call, the colleague who I told again and again that we could no longer work together insisted that while they earlier had said I was a terrible person, I was not a terrible person. They felt better now that I felt awful. I know they did not mean malice. They were acting out. I said, sorry, repeatedly a full stop apology multiple times. I more than once asked what actions I could take And that would often be met with a cycle through the grievances again. 
And really what you're seeing is the natural human tendency to gaslight. Um, we talk about gaslighting as a narcissistic, um, that, that if you gaslight, you must have narcissism. And that's just not true. Every human being, myself included, will engage in narcissistic tendencies on occasion, especially when we are arguing from our survival brain, because we're not rational, because we stop caring about anything other than our own comfort. Earlier in the email, um, the, the listener had said when I would ask how I deserve to be spoken to in this style, they said to me that my behavior had brought it upon me and they replied more than once that I deserved it. That's victim blaming. Um, it's blame shifting. We and, and so many times people are like, oh, well, why is everybody always a victim? That's bullshit. No, when you are not being spoken to in respectful tones in an environment where your voice is heard and your opinion is honestly and genuinely considered before a response is given, you're being victimized. And I'm not talking about we all need to like bring in the rescue team or anything, but I am talking about it's not okay to talk to people that way. And when you are being talked to that way, or when you're talking to somebody this way, that is one of the first indications that the conversation needs to end. Now, it sounds like this was a phone call um, or a conference call, like a, a Zoom meeting or something. Um, get really comfortable with hitting the red button. That is okay. I have no issues hanging up, even on Mason. So Mason can tell you, he's not here today to tell you, but I hung up on him the other day because we had a really difficult event happen recently in our lives that I'm sure we'll talk about here in a future podcast. We were arguing, um, which is not normal for us. We don't argue very often at all. And I was feeling triggered and I had asked him for a break and he was not responding, which is, again, I want to make sure everybody knows it's very abnormal for Mason. Normally Mason's really good at saying, okay, I'll give you a break. We'll come back to it after dinner or we'll talk about it again in the morning or whatever. Mason's normally very good at that. I actually suck at it um, more so than Mason does. Mason's better at it than me. I don't suck at it. I just, I don't do it as often as he does. Um, before it's too late. Mason's much better at it than me. I hung up on him. And then I sent him a text that said, when you are ready to talk to me in a clear-headed space, we can resume this conversation, but I'm going to ignore you for at least the next 20 minutes. Let me know when you're feeling better. Um, and he was able to, I mean, number one, he was pissed. In the beginning, he was livid. And rightly so. I think that that's normal if you hang up on somebody. Um, that's normal. Now, I'm not talking about hanging up on somebody as a weapon. I'm talking about hanging up on somebody as a boundary. And that boundary is nobody has the right to talk to me this way, even if I deserve it. It's not acceptable. We teach people how to treat us. And if we are willing to stay on a phone call or a conference call or in the room when somebody is engaging in this type of abusive communicative pattern, then we're basically giving them permission to do it again. And so if you want this to stop in your life, you have to get really good at self-advocating, which feels uncomfortable and saying, Nobody gets to talk to me this way, exiting the conversation and recognizing that that's going to feel like shit and then self-soothing and reassuring yourself that it's okay to demand respectful dialogue on difficult topics. Um, the listener goes on to say, it took me a day to get through this mentally, but it is okay I wanted to share this because as a person who deals with a lot of the mental issues that come up in the podcast, I was able to navigate the situation better for myself than I would in the past. I also wanted to mention why it is essential to be around people who are not this way. It is very, very hard to suss through truth and fiction when faced with this. Absolutely. Yes. Very, very true. It was hard to stay rational and my voice got raised more than a few times, but I quickly quieted it and listened. Number one, 
I love that you talk about it took you a day to get through it. That's normal. It is okay, especially in the beginning, for you to be agitated and not be able to stop thinking about an interaction like this for a prolonged period of time. Um, that's that's going to be normal. Um, I love, um, so I, I, I reached out and spoke to this person. I love that you took the time and got their permission to read the email before we got on here. But I love that you took the time to be able to um, regroup and rest and recover. Um, I also agree with you 100%. We teach people how to treat us. And if they don't learn the lesson, it's okay to say we cannot be friends. It is also okay. I saw this meme on Facebook because Facebook is my social media platform form recently that reminded me. I've seen it go around a few times and I saw it again recently. And one of the things that I love about it is it says, you know, it's okay to not be liked by everybody. You don't even like everybody. So it's okay. Um, it's hard when you have a working relationship with this person or when it's a familial relationship or if you used to have a really positive relationship and things have changed. Um, I'm not a fan of cutting people out of your life really, really quickly, but I am a fan of making sure that the relationships and the people you surround yourself with are healthy. I also want to say that healthy does not mean we all think alike. It is very important to have relationships with people who do not think like us, who do not agree with us on everything, but who can talk about those disagreements, whether they be political or religious or just, you know, moral standards, your, your interpretation of certain current events. You want to be able to have respectful dialogue with individuals that you don't agree with because it's great practice and wonderful diversity. If we are always surrounding ourselves with people who agree with everything that we say, then that's problematic because you're not being intellectually challenged ever. But if the people who are around you who disagree with you cannot express that in respectful, in a respectful way, then it's not healthy. Um, I have several friends who are still very much active in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, a.k.a. Mormon Church. And one of the things that I absolutely adore about these friends is that we can talk about some of the historical things that are upsetting. We can talk about some of the, you know, toxic cultural tendencies. And we can do so with love and respect, knowing that our goal is not to change the other person's opinion or to be agreed with, but to be understood. And to kind of gain deeper understanding about how each other's inner world works. So that is super fruitful. That's super meaningful. That's super healthy. But there has to be the right tone, the right setting. Um, be fed, be rested, um, be hydrated, take care of those, those bottom tier physiological needs that Maslow's hierarchy of needs talks about. Um, it's also this This listener says it was hard to stay rational and my voice got raised more than a few times. Yeah, your amygdala has got a little bit tickled or a lot bit tickled. I love that you say, but I quiet. I quickly quieted it and listened. Um, that means that you are practicing exercising that frontal cortex muscle where you're beginning to learn not to take somebody else's opinion or somebody else's behavior personally. Usually when somebody is engaging in this very disrespectful communication style, what that what that is normally an indication of is they have something going on that's unresolved, that needs some work, that maybe they're having a really bad day. Um, maybe they don't yet have the skill to um, engage outside of that survival response. And that's, I mean, it's okay. Everybody's at a different place in their life, but you didn't take their response personally because their response wasn't about you. Even though they were attacking you, it wasn't about you. Most of the time, 
unhealthy communication patterns are about the person communicating in an unhealthy way. And most of the time, we can't tell what it is that's going on for them that's making them communicate in this way. I know that, you know, when I engage in really unhealthy communication patterns, because I do this sometimes where I'll just, my mouth just goes and I start acting a fool and I don't live by the morals and standards that I have set for myself for being respectful to everybody. I'm human. I'm going to fuck this up just as much as you're going to fuck this up. But I know that generally it's because I've got something going on for me that I haven't flushed out yet. And when I'm in my survival brain, I don't have the same capacity to be respectful and calm and engaged with the people around me. This is like, you know, when I come home grumpy and struggling, all of my kids are like, hide from mom because she's going to give us chores because mom, when mom gets grumpy, the house gets clean. Um, that's just the way things work at the last Rick house. And my kids don't like that. Um, and understandably so. They don't want to be doing chores when mom's cranky because then mom is mean. And so I have to learn how to deal with my own shit before I engage in conversation with other people. And so when somebody is engaging with you in this way, recognize that most of the time it's about them, not about you. And it takes a lot of practice to not take this type of behavior personally. But once you master that and you're like, hey, this isn't about me, this is about you, um, it feels liberating. It really does because you're not to blame for being mistreated. Even if you've done something wrong, you're not to blame for somebody else's mistreatment of you. You can take accountability for where you messed up and still be respected. You need to be respected. You can't learn. You can't gain anything from a conversation where your amygdala is being activated because you don't feel safe. Even the worst criminals in the world, when you yell at them and scream at them and, you know, they've done horrific things that everybody on the planet would be like, that's horrific. They don't deserve the disrespect back. I mean, do they deserve, is there certain punishments and should they be locked up so they can't hurt other people? Hell yes. But their capacity to understand the harm that they've done comes when people can engage with them in respectful ways where their survival brain isn't kicking into high gear. Okay. I know that sounds a little controversial, but it's, it's true. If, if I'm attacking you, if I'm attacking your character, if I'm telling you that you're an asshole, you're not going to listen to me. It just doesn't work that way. Um, the listener then said, please also remind us what words and phrases to say when people approach us with the semi-violent tone and mocking language. Um, first, to slow down the conversation. Secondly, to wrap it up or avoid loops. And lastly, to reflect some of the feelings back so there can be a recognition of the pain that they are causing. So the first thing that I would say is if the person is not capable of calming down and speaking to you in a respectful way, the best thing to do is to disengage. And I would use things like, I am feeling very uncomfortable. So I'm going to talk about me. I am feeling very uncomfortable with the way that this conversation is going. I'm going to hang up now. And I would love to come back to this when we are both ready to talk to each other in a respectful manner. Click. Okay. Hey, Billy, why don't we tell them what we're about, man? So we're here to welcome you to the Madhouse Chronicles. It's a talk show with myself, Billy Morrison. And me, as the Osborne. This man, Prince of Darkness, and we watch and react to the maddest internet clips. What do we discuss, Ozzy? Drugs, rock and roll, aliens, all that kind of shit. Drugs, rock and roll, aliens, and all that kinds of shit. Come and join Ozzy and myself. Visit OsborneMediaHouse.com to get special access to... Come to, on! What do you say? Do you think it's the wildest show on the internet oh. <laughs> um, 
I would also say, hey, can we both, or I, if if I want to try and take the conversation, I'd say, hey, can we both take a deep breath and start over and talk to each other with respectful tones? If the answer is no, click. Um, so disengaging is just really important. Okay. Um, to wrap it up or avoid loops, again, you're going to talk about your own experience. So this is where you would say things like, I don't see it that way. I don't remember it that way. Um, if they start calling you names, like how can you be so stupid that you don't remember it this way? You know, you can argue with them and say, well, everybody has a different perspective. But as soon as I start calling you names, it's, hey, nobody's allowed to talk to me. Like, I don't tolerate being called names. That's not productive. It's incredibly critical. And we're not going to find a resolution at this time. So I'm going to talk to you later, okay? When we can do this calmer. Click, okay? So you've got the words, but I'm also giving you permission to disengage. Um, and lastly, to reflect the feelings back. If a person is able to engage in a conversation with you, if they are making an effort to speak to you differently after you have requested it, then you need to be able to validate their reality. Validation does not mean that I agree with you. Not at all. Validation is, you know what? It makes sense to me that you felt that way. If that's how you perceived what was going on, I'm incredibly sorry. That is not what I meant. Get specific. You know, I know that oftentimes Mason will um, will have said so. So recently, um, he told me that uh, he felt like I was putting somebody else first, and I was like, you know what? That makes sense. The experiences that you've had with me, I make decisions really quickly. You tend to need more time to make those decisions, so I can absolutely see how my quick decision making and not listening to your opinion before. I was out the door, definitely indicated that I was putting that person first. That was not my intent. Then later we were able to talk about, was I actually putting that other individual first or was it a perception based on fear? And really what we came down to was, is probably a little bit of both. Um, and then I was able to take responsibility for where I was not taking the counsel um, or, or the concerns of Mason seriously before making a decision. Um, I'm not saying that I had to do it the way Mason wanted me to do it, but rather I need to take more time to listen to his opinions and consider them before jumping into action. Um, but we would have never gotten there if I could not have validated him. I'm here to tell you, I didn't feel like I was putting anybody first above my family ever. I, I, I disagree almost completely with that statement. And I say almost because after we were calm, we were like, oh, hey, this time you kind of did. And this time you kind of did. So, you know what I mean? We, we, we were able to work through it, but not until I had validated his opinion. I also add an emotion to that validation. You know what, Mason, I can see why me putting this other individual first makes you so scared or makes you so upset or is so incredibly frustrating. I get that you're frustrated. I get that you're you feel frustrated when I jump into action before you've had a time to the time to really process what's going on. That's really not fair of me. I really need to respect the time that it takes for you to process these things. Um, so I'm adding in the emotion that the speaker is feeling when I'm validating them. Okay, but you also need the person to do that back to you. This form of communication is outlined in the Gottman um, Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work, um, Raising Emotionally Intelligent Children. This is the, the information I'm pulling out right now comes directly from the Gottman curriculum. One of the things that I want to put a disclaimer on, though, is that the style of communication does not work and is actually dangerous in an abusive relationship. Because the abuser will take your confessions of vulnerability, your emotional states, your acknowledgement of their point of view and twist it in an unhealthy manner and use it against you. And so one of the things that you really have to recognize, again, it comes right back to this point is 
if the person on the other side is not willing or able to engage with you in a healthy manner, the best thing you can do is disengage and put distance between yourself and that person until there's either a mediator um, or, or a counselor or somebody that can help the two of you work through that. If this is a characterological domestic violence situation, characterological domestic violence is different from situational. So situational domestic violence means we were arguing, things got out of hand, and we laid hands on each other, or there was pushing, or I started calling you names. Characterological domestic violence means the situation doesn't make any sense. The violence comes out of nowhere and it's consistent. It happens all the time. Situational is more. It only happens when we get in a superheated argument. Characterological is number one, the argument makes absolutely no sense. And I'm going to abuse you no matter what you do. Even if you do everything right, you're still going to get in trouble for it. Okay. Situational abuse or domestic violence. Um, or violence in the workplace or whatever. Situational, you disengage until you can calm down and then you come back together when the conversation or when the environment is safe. Characterological domestic violence or characterological um, abuse in the workplace or whatever it is, you disengage and you keep distance between you because the behavior, the toxic behavior, the abusive behavior isn't changing. So you've got to be able to read the room and say, hey, what data supports or what data says I need to put consistent and continued distance between myself and the other party in order to stay healthy and safe. Um, if it's characterological, disengagement is almost always recommended, if not always recommended. I, I can't think of a situation where it wouldn't be. Um, but I really struggle with all-inclusive words, um, even though I use them a lot. So I want I want to make sure that you as the listener are able to say set and setting, number one, set and setting. Number two, ability or willingness to do things differently. Number three, measure the effort. Number four, speak in I statements and use those emotional words. Number five, don't talk. Don't continue the conversation if the necessary change is not occurring. You might have to come back to it later. That's okay. Keep track of how people treat you because if they're treating you badly and they're not putting in the effort to change, then chances are the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. If there's no effort to change, change is most likely not going to happen evaluate what you need to do to stay healthy. I know that not everybody has the luxury of being able to just walk out of the workplace or divorce a toxic partner or whatever the case may be. But as you are able and as you find resources, so if you're lacking the resources to get out, Find resources to help you get out. Um, that as you practice setting boundaries and honoring those boundaries, it becomes easier. I used to struggle with this and I wouldn't be able to stop thinking about it for weeks. Now it normally only takes me a few hours. Now normally it takes a healthy snack, uh, maybe a nap, a walk, uh, a good amount of water, um, some rest, and a third party person that I can just emotionally ventilate to, like just bleh, what happened to. That's usually what it takes for me to recover after having an incident of toxic communication in any asset of my any aspect of my life. That's usually all it takes for me, but I've got a lot of practice of hitting the red button or hanging up or disengaging. Um, thank you to I guess my very toxic family for for that. Um, it doesn't feel comfortable and that's okay. If you are stuck in an abusive relationship, I want you to be able to reach out by email or text message. Um, you've got 988, which is the mental health hotline. 
Um, you've got your child abuse reporting hotlines. You can Google it. Um, you can email local uh, domestic violence shelters or counselors and get advice and ask for help. I understand that not everybody is in a position where they can just walk away. But if you are in a position to walk away, oftentimes it's the best thing. Holidays. Oh my goodness. The holidays are a perfect time to relive and experience family drama and trauma um, or workplace drama and trauma. It is okay to, to armor up, to get prepared for what you most likely know is already going to happen because it's only happened how many times in the past. So get a plan, a safety plan put into place where you're like, oh my goodness, if dad and uncle Joe get at it again, then my response is going to be to, you know, I don't know, grab some leftover turkey and take a walk around the block. Or maybe it's instead of staying with my parents, I'm going to get a hotel room this year. Even if it's a cheap ass ghetto hotel room, that's going to feel better than staying with the people where I no longer have an out to get away. Make a plan for yourself so that way with your escape route in case you need to utilize it. And then make sure that after the challenging interactions that you also have a plan for rest, recovery, and relaxation. We all need that. I can only deal with challenging family members for a couple of hours before I am done. I really enjoy getting a hotel and staying at a hotel or camping at a state camp park or whatever the case may be so that I have the ability to escape if I need it. Other things I will do is I will attach my keys, my car keys to my person. So I have a little D clip on my car keys and I will attach it to my bra strap. So that way I don't lose my car keys. That way, if I need to just exit and go for a drive, I know where my car keys are. They are always right there and I'm able to walk out and just go. I also talk to the members of my family um, or friends that are going to be around me in these situations to say, hey, I struggle with this. So if you see me do this, I need your help. Or can we have a code word so that way you can help me get away? Or is there, you know, can you like run interference for me or like come up with a game plan with somebody that you trust? Um, I'm going to be honest. When I go to my husband's family events, there's a couple of family members I really struggle with. Um, he knows that if I leave, that I'm not coming back. Like that's our that's our thing. I'm like, hey, because your family lives in my hometown, I've got like 100 friends in that hometown that I have no issues showing up on their doorstep, knocking on the door and being like, hey, I'm here for Thanksgiving now. Thanks. I love you so much. Or, hey, I'm going to join you for Christmas dinner. Here's 100 bucks. Whatever. I don't mind doing that. And And Mason knows that if I take that exit route, it means I'm not coming back. It means I'm done. And we have an agreement that he will take the next however many minutes to gather up the kids and follow behind me and I will pick him up or whatever. We have that in place because I'm not going to be treated the way that his brother likes to treat me anymore. Like I don't do asshole. Like his brother has told us I'm an asshole and you just have to deal with it. And the answer is, if you choose to be an asshole, fine, but I don't have to deal with it. I do not have to have a relationship with you where you're allowed to mistreat me. And so if anything comes up, instead of engaging in a conversation, I just leave. And I am comfortable doing that. And frankly, when I walk out and it's awkward for everybody, guess what happens? They have learned Sarah does not tolerate this type of bullying. And it's changed things. Maybe in the better. Like I don't have very many interactions with that brother anymore because he is a self-proclaimed and proud of it asshole. And so nobody treats me like that. So because I disengage, he stopped engaging. And it's been amazing because now I can enjoy 
the relationships with the people who I really value and who really value me. Um, so we teach people how to treat us. If you don't tolerate it in a calm, collected, rational way, then behaviors change. And if they don't, that's an indication that maybe you need to change the environment that you are in when you're with that person. Um, I want to say thank you so much to the listener who emailed this to me. Number one, thank you so much for sharing your humanity, for acknowledging that, hey, I didn't necessarily do this perfect. I kind of got heated too at times. And then when I recognized it, I calmed down. That is a normal, natural human part of us. I'm going to tell you right now that sometimes with asshole brother, I didn't respond so great. Like I hold some responsibility in some of the Westbrook family drama, for sure. Sarah's got a mouth on her. Sarah's got a fight response. And man, I'm mean. When I get into my fight mode, I'm not a nice person. So I own some of the responsibility for the challenges in those relationships. Even though I own some of those challenges does not mean I then deserve to be treated like shit. It means I need to apologize for those times that I haven't done it. And I need to um, expect the other person to take accountability for their role in the dysfunction as well. Um, so I absolutely love that this listener acknowledged that they didn't necessarily do it perfectly. Um, make sure you are engaging in self-care after even, even if you cannot leave or you didn't leave or you had a plan to leave and then you didn't and then you stayed or you ended up engaging and you didn't like it. Recover rest. Give yourself some grace. Make the apologies that you feel are appropriate and recover. Nobody deserves to be treated like shit. Nobody deserves to be called names. Nobody deserves to be gaslit or have their reality questioned. Nobody, not even my schizophrenic son whose reality isn't real. I am here to tell you when he is in that schizophrenic brain, if I start to question his reality, he gets more agitated and I can't get him healthy. So I don't care how real or unreal the person's reality seems or how real or unreal your reality seems. We can't challenge it when we're in survival brain. It's just not helpful. So please take care of yourself. Give yourself grace. Recognize when you're in that fight, flight, freeze, fawn response. Soothe it. Think through it rationally. Own your part. And then make the amends that you need to. Consider the data that you're gathering as to whether or not the relationship is worth it to you to continue to engage in. And if it's not, give yourself permission to disengage, either temporarily or permanently. Good luck this holiday season. This has been kind of a preachy episode, not trying to preach, trying to educate, but I want you to do what is best for your own well-being. Surround yourself with people who love you, who respect you, and who can disagree with you and stay respectful and friends and loving. Sometimes it's hard to find those people. When you find them, value that relationship, honor it, take care of it, nurture it, and happy holidays. Bye, everybody. Hey, head on over to Amazon and buy your copy of Trauma Bonded, a true story of navigating attachments forged in complex PTSD by me, Sarah Westbrook.